Hey everybody, Chris here from the Off Grid Schoolie. Just a little bit of a disclaimer before you start watching this video. I am not an electrician, neither is Aaron. And if you are looking to do your own solar setup, make sure that you hire someone that knows what they're doing. This video by no means is an example of what you should do. It's just an example of what I did for my solar setup. Thanks for watching. me why I've got nothing to say Now the CN in black Yeah, what we're gonna do is we've got some battery cables that are already made, but what we're, we put this thing into a 3x3 grid. This whole battery system is parallel at 12 volts, which is a massive amount of amperage for the size of these batteries. In lead acid batteries, you want to try to balance your discharge and charge off of these. So what we end up doing is having you peel off your power off of one side because this each you just connect you jumper these terminals to each other like this, and then you take another set and you go here, and that's parallel together. Parallel means that you stack the the positives and the negatives together, and you add more amperage to your battery pile versus and so but the voltage stays the same. It's just you stack on more capacity for that battery to discharge. When you put it in series, every time you put a negative to a positive and a negative to a positive, it double it it adds the voltage together. It's additive. So if you have a three volt battery and a three volt battery, um, you'll have six volts from here to here. You'll still have three volts between each battery. Or if you have a 12 volt battery, you have 12 and 12, and you have 24 and then you have 36, and then you have 48. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go 12, 12, 12, 12, across this way instead, or 12, 12, 12. By bisecting the direction that the current flows out of these batteries, uh, we're giving the current an equal opportunity to discharge and return back the loop of the path. If we put both of the connection points for the batteries, so if we parallel them up like this and like that, um, and the same for the ground, I don't have those ones made, and we pulled all the terminals off of this side, this battery here would take the brunt of the charge and discharge all the time. This one would be a little less, and this one would be the, the big lazy battery. It would never do anything. I know that Battleborn batteries, because they are lithium, they have a BMS in there, they can do interesting things inside of them, like disconnect from the circuit and all sorts of other stuff. I still believe that it's important to try to give it an opportunity to have equal current flow from both sides of the batteries. This guy here is our voltage, our amperage shunt. So this is a 500 amp shunt, which means that it's just a resistor, meaning if you have exactly 12 volts coming on one side of this, you'll have 11.9995 uh, volts on the other side. So there's that little bit of power is shed as heat and a computer can measure the voltage of the two sides and, and by knowing the voltage drop across the calculated resistance, which is uh, in this case a 50 millivolt drop, we can then calculate how many amps of current are traversing this shunt at any particular time. So we need to wire that. So basically, all, if this is your ground lug, which is going to go here, and all of the grounds from all of these batteries connect to that, then all the grounds have to go through this shunt. There is no other place we ground anything. You can never put any extra taps of ground or anything on this terminal because that would bypass the shunt and then make an inaccurate measurement of power. The reason we need an accurate measurement of power is because then that connects to all the Victron equipment and gives us all sorts of information about time to empty, time to full, charging performance, all that stuff that we want to know about. Um, that's, the st that's the instrumentation that you have to have to really be successful when you're doing solar work and you're trying to like harvest as much money. You're, you're a sun farmer at this point. So Chris, you're gonna have to start obsessively looking at your harvest each day to see whether you can actually turn on your electric items. And I'm excited all for that, that stuff. Very excited for that. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. In this case was to figure out the orientation of the batteries. And the orientation is then, is actually dictated by how we want to draw the power off of these batteries. So like we were talking about parallel or series, 
it really it helps to try to shuffle the batteries around like it's like one of those little puzzles with the numbers you got to get it in the right order it helps to get the batteries optimally arranged for the geometry that you're trying to put your battery in in either all parallel or all series or series parallel depending on how you want to charge and discharge and in many cases the chemistry of the battery if it if it's lithium or lead acid or whatever um, dictates the most optimal way to put these together and then of course you know there's other factors we're just you you and I were talking about if we rotated the whole pack 90 degrees but we have this shelf and it's hard to get to the terminals it's nice to be able to visually see everything in here having it neat and clean and serviceable is really important I mean yeah you're usually walking over them like 99 percent of the time but then that one time that you need to pop, pop a battery out because it died or maybe there's a loose connection or whatever it is hopefully there's no loose connections we'll use little paint markers for that you need to be able to take it apart without ripping everything apart and having it be hazardous or dangerous and you need to be able to put stuff in in, this, in such a way so for instance if this terminal sitting here you know we're driving down the road and for whatever reason it decides to vibrate loose you don't really want it to try to touch anything else its swing radius should be something outside of that space so we can cover these up with a little bit of uh, insulating material or just in such a way that it'll just sort of boing out like that and then it'll you know come out here there's a lot of small considerations to take to where you this is a dangerous thing like fires can happen explosions all sorts of bad stuff happens here and so by being very conservative in the way that we try to hook everything up either with you know consult your ampacity charts and make sure you're over your minimums for current carrying capacity on your wiring to um, we have some big mega fuses that we have to mount in here to connect everything and protect the wiring and all sorts of stuff. You have to make sure all that space and you know lay out all your parts and stuff. So we're going to start screwing all these things in and put the mega fuses in here and get all these carriers and stuff. And then once we have that in, then we can start making the rest of all of our cables and connecting the ends and stuff. But we're definitely you know we're roughing out what we've got. So these these lines here they kind of loop underneath the frame of the vehicle and floor and up around over by the inverter around the corner here but we want to just make them just long enough to where we don't screw up and cut them too short and then <laughs> waste a lot of wire oh look we made a lot of jumpers all of a sudden because we had to run a whole new piece so I think that's those are the important bits for this installation the physical put it together you've already decided on a whole other lot of factors this is just coloring in the rest of it at this point all right so we're um making some small jumper cables. We're going to be doing ground stuff right now. So if you look at these terminal blocks here. So what I'm going to do is just take my big old chunk of cable here and I'm measuring a distance between here. Then trying to make sure that I have enough length so like I totally mounted that way too close to each other because those won't even do anything. These ones are probably a little close too. So that's a little too optimistic. So I'm going to actually unscrew these. Move over. This is a little more. And at the lower voltage, it matters more too. So, what we're doing here is we've got a couple bus bars. I'm just loosening up all these nuts on it because they're installed tight. And I'm trying to figure out the spacing for this wiring plan I've got. So, what I've got is my shunt, which is on the negative side. This will be my battery terminal receiving all of the negatives from all of my groups onto this guy. So there's going to be one, two, three groups. Then I'm going to have to make a little pop over to the shunt because you can't have anything not going through the shunt. The shunt must intercept all power. So we're going to just make this tiny little jumper cable right here. And then we're going to make another little tiny jumper cable right here. All these terminals here are going to provide us with the connections for the... Uh, the inverter chargers and the solar controllers because the inverter charger has two grounds to it because it's got two parallel cable paths to it and then solar controllers also have grounds so we have we have to terminate four lugs from equipment over there and maybe even potentially something else in the future so we need to have a whole bunch of this is like our basically our power distribution bus bar which is literally what this is so what we're going to end up with is a bunch of cables that are going to snake around this way and go over to all the equipment over here. And then 
not shown yet, we'll get there once it orders, is we're going to get some red ones on this side and doing the same thing, except we won't have a, uh, we won't have a shunt in the place of it. We're going to have a big fuse in the place of it instead, a big monster fuse in here, and that's going to break the connection back from the, from those guys in case something bad happens. So we'll have the power positive side of all this equipment and it'll have fuses between the bus bar and those devices to protect the cable length across from there. So I'm going to get to measuring the stuff here. So here, let's, this is always satisfying cutting these cables. So what I do is I sort of eyeball how long it's going to be and I look at this other side here. Oh, by the way, these particular shears are really great. You want to eyeball your wire measure it if you want. I just sort of look at it and I want to be able to poke the copper all the way up into where the crimp starts to, on these guys right to here. So I'm going to cut this cable right there. That gives me that little bit of space there. So when I cut these, it's really nice. I mean, you can just cut them. It's just really easy to cut this stuff. Don't screw around with sawing stuff. Don't razor blade. Don't do it. You'll wreck it. And then what I use is a stripper. This is actually, these are PEX cutters. <laughs> uh, and they work for cutting all sorts of other stuff. And so you'll see I line this up simply to the edge of the blade and to where I want to strip here. And I just sort of give it a little pressure and spin. What I'm looking for is when I start to see a little bit of that copper, because I don't want to cut any of the strands of copper. As soon as you cut any of the strands, you've screwed up because you've lost ampacity. So when you pull this apart, you should see that there's no copper strands in there. And this looks super nice and clean right here. So then what we can do is take one of these uh, connectors. And when you put it on, look for any wires that are stacked out. You can see there's one right there. Just press them against. And you want to carefully push it in there. If it doesn't go, don't force it because then it'll stack all the wires. You just kind of watch it and you can look around and you can feel it and it should just slide in really nice like that. And that's it. Um, I'm going to get my crimper all ready. So this is a hydraulic crimper. Um, basically it's like a little tiny hydraulic jack. You turn it on and you pump and the hydraulics go in there. I think this is a 10 ton. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't even say what it is. It's a Chinese thing. But I got it off of Amazon, it was like 35, 40 bucks. It was on sale, normally like 50 or 60. But dude, it, you can't crimp big lugs without something like this. I know that there's the type where you can hammer them. I know that some people solder stuff, but let me address both of the hammering and the soldering kind. So the hammering kind, it's effective, but I don't like the act. You don't have control or accuracy. Not everybody can do a perfect dead blow every time. So if you're like, dead blow dick and you've been framing houses for 30 years, do it dude, I, it's probably fine. Another way that people often will say is, oh we should solder it. And so yes, that is also an applicable way to do it. However, what happens when solder heats up? Say, oh I don't know, an electrical fault. It gets hot, it can melt, it can also embrittle. So when solder gets hot and melts, it loses its electrical connection and gets even worse and then therefore becomes a point of resistive heating and just is a fire hazard. Um, loses all mechanical strength. And there's nothing holding it in place. If you uh, solder a piece of wire that's really long, the solder always wicks up the copper and makes this whole copper part stiff. Now, on a really big, huge piece of cable like this, it doesn't really matter that much because it's pretty strong. But smaller stuff, soldering, it can, in a vibrating environment, um, where the solder is at, it can actually break the wire right off. So it turns that stranded you know, very flexible kind of copper into a solid piece of wire and just snaps and it can and mechanically just break. And you're, when you're crimping big stuff, hydraulic crimper gives you the most control and the ability to really see that you've crimped it correctly. Because, at, at, you know, are, are you really going to know that you've applied the correct amount of torque every time you've whacked that thing with the, with the hammer crimper? Maybe, but I don't know. I loosen up the crimper, I put my piece in there. And you'll notice that I've clocked this particular piece so you can turn these different ways. So in my case, where I'm setting this at, I want this to be clocked like this. I could get fancy and clock one, maybe, 
Maybe this way? I don't know. It's kind of six into one, half a dozen the other. What do you think, Chris? Should I go like that and make it look cool, or should I probably go this way and have it be all, all standard? Uh, cool. You want it cool. Okay, so we're going to make it cool. So by making it cool, we're going to go like this. So I've already crimped this side. You can see the crimp all the way around it. Something that's really fascinating when you crimp this is that I can bend this still right now, but all the fibers of the wire are captured in this piece, and it does not move on this side. So right now I can bend this, but as soon as I crimp this, it's going to basically turn into a solid piece of copper because the copper is going to be crimped on both sides, and the wire basket weave of the copper all twisted up will kind of hold it as one piece. So I'll load it in my crimper, make sure it's set for crimping here. The valve is closed, so it holds the hydraulic pressure. I'm just going to pump it with my hand here. So it doesn't really matter until you sort of get it actually crimped in there. You'll note that the jaws and the die are really close, choked up to where the, f the flare is at on the fitting. Um, if I go down to this side, it won't grab the wire as much, so you want to grab it up and choke it up this far. You don't want to go too far past the flare, but just beyond the flare. So now that it's kind of engaged it, I can still rotate it, and that allows me to do last second sort of placement and make sure that it's just clocked just how I want it to. So then as I continue pumping, it starts to get really tight. It's my last chance for straightness. And you can see I'm just doing it with one hand. I don't need to do any heroics here. But as I get closer to the edge, when this jaw starts, i got to actually sort of squeeze it pretty tight. And it's, when, it die, when the die closes fully around it, you've selected the correct size die, and it's applied all the torque at will. So you know that that is crimped fully. There is no guesswork. So then I release the die, and there's my piece. So when I try to bend this now, it only parallelograms. It does not, it does not bend at all because it's fully captured and, and crimped inside of this piece. You can see the crimp all the way around. There are nicer crimpers. This is just a cheap one, but even a cheap one is better than no crimper. And so now, when we drop this piece onto the lug, because this, the reason I did this offset is because this terminal is a little higher than this one and it kind of looks neat when you stick it on there. This is like, the, this is your artistic uh, license for putting wiring together. So drop that on there. So there's two types of shrink tubing. There's kinds that has like hot glue inside of it and there's kinds that don't. Hot glue kind is preferable because when it shrinks, the glue melts and melts into all the little crevices and water seals it watertight. Clearly we're inside of a vehicle that shouldn't get wet in here. It doesn't really matter much, but it's just like, it's good practice. So what I'm doing is I'm just cutting these shrink tubes pieces. They got to be big enough to slide over the, the, the bits here. If you have to put the shrink tube on the wire beforehand on the terminal lugs like this, you probably got too small shrink tubing. So you should be able to slide it over and you want to cover it. You don't want to go over the flat area, that's the conductive area. You want to go only over where the bulge is at and then kind of stop right there. So kind of edge, edge like that. And we'll shrink it down with heat gun. So basically you apply heat evenly. You can use a torch, you can use matches, you can use put on your armpit maybe. It might take a long time. I hate torches because it can burn stuff. I don't like other stuff because it stinks. Heat guns are highly controllable and they're not that expensive. You can actually use like a paint stripper, like this from Home Depot, it's, it's also the same thing. So you turn this on, turn it on high. It's hot, it'll burn you, you can see it glows. And then you just sort of rotate it on the rotisserie until it shrinks down. So once it's done, Shrink wrap is far more permanent. It doesn't unwrap, so you can wrap it with electrical tape. You don't really need to do anything. It's still going to carry the electricity. The thing is, is that putting shrink wrap around these sharp edges prevents damage and scuffing of other things rubbing on it. It just makes it look a lot cleaner. Here, let's put the other one on this side and we'll compare it between the two of them. You can tell me which one looks like not as scary. Also, this can get really hot, so you got to be careful because it's copper. Arms in real fast, so I'm gonna line this one up. There we go. So we can compare these two. I like the one with the shrink wrap. It just looks more professional. Um, if I'm not quoting Wikipedia directly here, but 
you could say that shrink wrap is a dielectric medium that prevents arcing and other type of electrical transmission through here. So by using shrink wrap instead of uh, electric tape or something like that, the electric tape can unwind. Hi, Dookie. He's going to help too. Oh, Mr. Dookie. Uh, it just, it's just a cleaner install and it's more durable mostly. It's faster. So I'm putting soft clamps in. I'm kind of actually beginning to dress some of this cable here because what this is telling me, it's going to inform me how much cable I'm going to have left and whether we need to order more on Amazon or not. But um, just putting these clamps kind of holders in here keeps them all off of things and not catching. But you usually just have to pick a side that you want to start working from. So if you start working from the middle outwards, you tend to waste a lot of materials. If you start from one side and try to run all your cabling, in this case, we're going from the battery hole back to the inverter chargers, we'll be able to size this cable correctly. Because the whole plan here is to run the negatives on this side and the positives on this side. So when we get over to this side, we're going to be a little crowded, but we'll be able to tuck all of our negative terminals and things underneath here and cables. You see how this extra floppiness here, once I route this around like this, um, I can pull all the slack out of it from the other side and then clip it off at the inverter here and then I'll be able to pull back the rest of the cable and run my second run around there. That way I know how we've got it. Um, my prediction right now is, is that we'll have just enough we may be a little short, so we'll find out here. Because we got to save enough battery cable to be able to connect up the batteries. I am sitting wedged between the wall and Chris's bed, and this is the uh, inverter charge controller. The quad this is a Victron MultiPlus 3 kVA unit, and it takes two battery terminals for positive and two battery terminals for negative. So this is kind of the area where like uh, you're wedged in a cramped little hole and you're trying to put this together and it's pretty critical these go correctly because if they go wrong you one you've wasted cable that you've already connected over on the other side and two it'd be really bad to like damage the inverter or something like that so you know tackle the ones that are awesome like this after you've got a few terminations under your belt I'm being very conservative how I pry this apart because I get basically one shot at the length of cable that I want for this. If I screw up and have to cut it again, I'm not going to have enough length left in it. So, so let me get this in here. So I don't know if your camera can see below, but I'm sort of lining up both of these cables to look nice down in the corner. So I do that. Another thing with these types of inverters is that you have to be pretty careful when you're working with the face open. Not that you're going to shock anything, because of course power is disconnected, but uh, it's these are pretty fragile pieces, and you know they've got conformal coating on some of them to keep them from corrosion and whatever. But it would be pretty easy to bend one of these little transistors right off the side or whatever if you're not careful. So you just you gotta mind it. Only have the lid off long enough to really do what you need to do and then put it back on. Also, don't drop things in it. No metal shavings. Me, why I've got nothing. 